Hebrews chapter 5 A better high priest after Melchizedek, not Aaron. 5 colon 1 dash for the office of the high priest given to Aaron. 5 colon 5 dash 10 Christ is a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 5 colon 11 dash 14 be skilled in the word of God and warning that their ears are dull. We can rightly divide the threefold ministry of Jesus. Prophet Priest King During his earthly ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John After his resurrection and ascension in Acts 1 During early Acts and the tribulation in Hebrews to Revelation At his second coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords While he was on earth Past While he is in heaven Present when he returns. Future. Moses was a prophet, priest, and king to Israel in the wilderness, Deuteronomy 18:15, 33 colon 5, Hebrews 9 verse 19. We can rightly divide the threefold ministry of Jesus. Jesus Christ was prophet, past, is priest, present, and will be king, future, of Israel. But Jesus Christ is the prophet Moses spoke about, a prophet similar to himself in Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 to 19, and Acts 3 verses 22 and 23. Jesus was their prophet while he was on earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus Christ the Son is their high priest in heaven during the tribulation, Hebrews through Jude, and Jesus Christ will be the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords of Israel when he returns Revelation. While on earth the Lord Jesus alluded to his threefold ministry. Jesus referred to his office as priest, that in this place is one greater than the temple, Matt, 12, 6. Jesus referred to his office as a prophet, a greater than Jonas is here, Matt, 12, 41. Jesus referred to his office as a king, a greater than Solomon is here, Matt, 12, 42. In this chapter, we will deal with some of the very personal, sensitive, and intimate struggles that our Lord Jesus went through to save mankind. How did Jesus Christ fear while on earth? What does hard to be uttered mean? What is meant by discern both good and evil? What is strong meat? 5 colon 1 for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, to who can have compassion on the ignorant, and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. 3 and by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. God had wisdom in instituting the priesthood. The priests offer an animal sacrifice to cover a man's sins to appease God. He mediated a temporary peace between God and men. For every human high priest, taken from among men is ordained as a mediator or go, between God and men, to offer both gifts and sacrifices for their sins. Since the high priest has similar infirmities, sinful weaknesses, as the other people, he can have compassion on the people who are ignorant of what sins they have done, the Jews killed Jesus not knowing he was their Messiah, and on them that are out of the way, lost sheep who do not know God's ways 310. The human priest himself also sins. For this reason, the priest ought to offer sacrifices for sins, not only for the people, but for himself. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest offered bull's blood for himself and the scapegoat's blood for the people, Leviticus 16 verses 12 and 13. The Aaronic priesthood was surrounded with weaknesses and infirmities because of the sins of the priests and could never totally meet Israel's needs. There are no legitimate priests during the dispensation of grace. How many priests do you know that offer animal sacrifices? That is right none because priests were for Israel's program. The body of Christ are not priests, they are ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 21. Dot. For in no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. 5 So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. 6 As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. No man takes the honor of being a high priest on himself, but God called Aaron and his sons and his descendants to that office. God appointed Aaron and his family to be Israel's high priests on earth, 1 Chronicles. 
649, the rest of the Levites served in the work of the temple and taught the people God's word, 1 Chronicles 6 verse 48. Likewise, Christ did not glorify himself by appointing himself the high priest. But God the Father, the same one that said, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, Hebrews 5 verse 5 compare with Psalms 2 verse 7, said in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Psalms 110 verse 4, Genesis 14 verses 18 to 20. Spelled Melchizedek in the Old Testament. He did not glorify himself by taking that office. Messiah, Hebrew, and Christ, Greek, mean anointed. The same one that begot his son from the dead, Psalms 2 verse 7, Acts 13 verse 33, also honored his son by appointing him high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, forever. The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Psalms 110 verse 4. It was after his resurrection that the father ordained his son as the high priest, mediator. This Godman, the Mun Christ Jesus, is also the mediator for the body of Christ, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Dot. 7 Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, ate though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, 9 And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, 10 Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. How did Jesus Christ fear while on earth? He trusted God's word, Isaiah 50 verse 4. When Jesus was in a human body, he offered up praise and requests in the garden of Gethsemane, with strong crying and tears to the Father that was able to save him from having to go through the most excruciating physical and spiritual death of all in Matt, 26 colon 36 dash 46, Mark 14 verses 32 to 42, Luke 22 verses 39 to 46. John 17 verses 1 to 26. The spirit was willing but the flesh was weak. His flesh could hardly bear the thought of what he had to go through. He had been asked to taste death for every man. The temptation not to go to the cross was strong. Jesus was sweating, as it were great drops of blood, Luke 22 verse 44. He was under tremendous pressure. The garden of Gethsemane is still full of old olive trees, Gethsemane means olive press. Jesus prayed to God three times that night in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus heard the Father speak his will in his word. Jesus relied on the word of God, Psalm 16 verses 1 and 10, Psalm 22, Psalm 69 verse 15, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27, Jonah, etc. There was no other way to save his people from their sins, Matt, 121. He told his father, not my will, but thine, be done, Luke 22 verse 42, demonstrating his faith in the father's plan for him to go to the cross. Once he had prayed and talked with the father three times about having to drink the cup of his wrath of God, Revelation 14 verse 10, he was at peace with his decision to obey the father. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest, behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going behold, he is at hand that doth betray me, Matt, 26 colon 36 dash 46. Notice how Jesus was resolute and in charge. His inner circle of disciples gave into their flesh and fell asleep. 
but the son was awake and watched all night. Like a loving parent he let them sleep while he worked. He decided to go through with the cross, he set his face as a flint. He had determined to go to the cross. For the Lord God will help me, therefore, shall I not be confounded, therefore, have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed, Isaiah 50 verse 7. The Lord said to Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? John 18 verse 11. He was able to bear it by the comfort of prayer and verses like Psalm 16 verses 1 and 10, 110 colon 1 which said he would be raised. His attitude was, I delight to do thy will O my God, Psalms 40 verse 8. We will never understand all that he went through. He could have asked his father to send angels to help him avoid being executed. But he was willing to be led to the cruel cross, as lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth, Isaiah 53 verse 7. He did not defend himself during the various fraudulent trials and hearings because he knew he came to die for mankind's sins. He trusted that the Father would accept his sacrifice for sin and raise him from the dead. The Father was satisfied with the blood payment of his Son. Notice how the scriptures prophesy of the Father being satisfied by the Son's future propitiation, fully satisfying blood sacrifice. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities, Isaiah 53 verse 11. Christ's sacrifice satisfied holy God's justice. His righteous servant was able to justify the many of Israel that believed, for he bore their iniquities. Paul later let the body of Christ know that Jesus not only was a ransom for the many of Israel in prophecy, Matt, 2028, but that he was a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2 verse 6. Jesus Christ also died for our sins in mystery, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. Jesus Christ was the sum total of everything that the perfect high priest should be. Not only was Christ the high priest for Israel after the order of Melchizedek, and he was also the sacrifice. Though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered 5 colon 8. He had perfect obedience even to death on the cross. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross philosophy. 2 colon 8 his perfect payment was accepted as evidence by his resurrection in a glorified body. Jesus Christ feared the Father by obeying the Father and doing what he asked. Jesus Christ was made perfect by his perfect flawless obedience. He was made perfect by believing and doing what God said. He willingly suffered death on the cross. He became the author, originator, of eternal salvation for those who faithfully obey, believe, and do what God asks to the end of their lives or the end of the tribulation. Christ wrote the book on it. He secured eternal salvation unto all them that obey him by his perfect obedience, faith accompanied by action to God. To obey Jesus Christ is to believe and do what he asked, his instructions to them. People are saved by faith in all dispensations, but in prophecy their faith is proved by their actions, James 2 verses 22 to 24. James said, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only James 2 verse 24. Works accompany that faith in prophecy. For Israel certain works are not optional. Circumcision was an everlasting covenant even for the strangers, Gentile believers, in their homes. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh physical circumcision, for an everlasting covenant, Genesis 17 verse 13. Water baptism was also required of the nation of Israel, that would be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 40 verse 12. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him, and to his seed throughout their generations, Exodus 30 verse 21. Peter was speaking to Jews that were already circumcised when he said, Repent, and be baptized receive the Holy Ghost Acts 2 verse 38. In contrast, the baptism and the circumcision for the body of Christ are both spiritual, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, Colossians 2 verses 11 and 12. Dot. 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. 
The writer of Hebrews and his fellow believers have many deeper things to say to them about Jesus the Son of God, their Apostle, and High Priest, but they are hard to be uttered said. What does hard to be uttered mean? It is difficult for the writer, and God the author, to tell them more about their High Priest since they are dull of hearing. Their knowledge of the Word is immature. They are not ready to hear and understand His words. Their ears are dull to His voice in the Holy Scriptures. They have become such as have need of milk, babies who need to be nursed at the breast of their mothers, and not such as can tolerate solid food. Jesus said, Who has ears to hear, let him hear, Matt, 13, 9. The unbelieving religious leaders blasphemed Jesus, and said he cast out devils by Beelzebub of 2 Kings 1 verse 3, the devil Matt, 12, 24 30. Jesus was asked why he was spoke, uttered, in parables. A parable is a fable or allegorical representation of something from everyday life to that illustrates a spiritual parallel in real life. It is like a dark, hidden, saying, Psalm 78 verse 2, a riddle, Ezekiel 17 verse 2, or a proverb, Habakkuk 2 verse 6. Jesus answered and said that the reason he spoke in parables was, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, whoever has understanding will receive more knowledge of God's word, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath, the knowledge he has will be removed. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them, Matt. 13,11-15 Jesus quoted Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10. Jesus began to speak in parables so that only those who had a believing heart, the believing remnant, his followers, would understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Israel's unbelieving religious leaders have eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear, nor understand. Like the prophet Isaiah's Greek for Isaiah, said, and he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed, Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10. They are not able to see, hear, or understand the word of God because they closed their senses, minds, and hearts to his word. They did not believe he was who he said he was, the Son of God. They minimized and added their own traditions to his word. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not, John 5 verses 37 and 38. They did not believe because God was not their father, John 8 verses 43 and 44. Jesus and the Father are one, John 10 verse 30. Many people never seek the truth of God in the Bible. During the tribulation, many will reject the truth, they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. Dot. 12 For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. The writer of Hebrews wants to continue into the deeper truth of what their high priest did in heaven after Calvary, but before he can move on, he must give them some milk. By this time the tribulation ye ought to be teachers, but they need the writer to give them some milk before he can move on to the solid food related to Christ's priesthood. They have needed that one teaches them again the first principles of the oracles of God, what God spoke in his word, Romans 3 verse 2. The basic principles are as the rudimentary or elementary ABCs of what God said in the Old Testament, the four gospels, and early acts. Amazingly the writer has been and continues to teach them by example how to study the Bible for themselves. The readers have need of milk, but are not ready for the solid spiritual food that God wants to tell them in Hebrews about their high priest. 13 For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. 
For everyone who continues to need to be fed with milk is unskillful in the use of God's word which speaks of his saints receiving his son's holiness or righteousness for he is a babe. It is the word of God that changes us from the inside out. Paul called it having the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. They should believe the gospel of the kingdom that was at hand because the king, the son of God, had arrived precisely according to Daniel's timeline and also endure to the end of the tribulation. Peter said that they are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever 1 Peter 1 verse 23. They are born again by believing God's word to them. They are to take up their cross and follow Jesus Christ, Matt, 16.24. Their cross is being willing to suffer and endure the tribulation, not drawing back to perdition, returning to animal sacrifices in the temple, nor worshipping Antichrist and his image in the temple. The body of Christ, on the other hand, is saved by believing the gospel of Christ without doing any works of any kind, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9. They are warned that they are babes in their understanding of the word of God, when they should be teachers by now, in other words read and study the Bible carefully. The Bible is meant to be understood rightly divided. 14 But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. But solid food, advanced understanding of Christ's accomplishment on Calvary, and as their high priest, belongs to them that are of full age, mature adults. Because of frequent, thoughtful, purposeful, use of the word of God, they have their senses trained to detect both good and evil. What is meant by discern both good and evil? Even those who because of experience with the scriptures have their minds practiced to distinguish between right and wrong, truth from error, so too they can grasp the truth of what God said, and detect what God did not say. It is the Holy Spirit in the believer that gives them illumination, enlightenment. When they carefully and attentively read the Bible for the purpose of understanding what God said they can be honest with the word without adding their human viewpoint. Strong truths are for people who by skillful use and experience in the word of God in Bible study have eyes to see the particular precise words God uses, the repetition of phrases, recognize connections between verses, and glean more from what God said. They have ears that prick up when they hear the truth in God's word, and they swallow the truth down into their inner being. The truth goes from their mind to their heart, the hard rive of their soul, when they believe it, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. God's word is how to know God. The wise read and believe the word of God. Jesus said, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matt, for colon 4. Because they are untrained in the word of God, the writer will do a brief review in the next chapter for their benefit before he moves on. Chapter 6 Let us go on unto perfection, maturity. 6 colon 1 dash 3 basic principles that they should already know and move on from. 6 colon 4 dash 12 exhortation not to fall away, but to continue their labor of love. 6 colon 13 dash 15 God's oath to Abraham. 6 colon 16 dash 20 their high priest's entrance behind the veil is an anchor of the soul. Warning not to fall away after believing the truth. Hebrews through Revelation is about Christ's second coming, not the rapture. The writer wants to tell them the deeper things concerning their high priest, but takes the time to review so that they can hear what is said. In early Acts, the apostles were empowered by the Holy Ghost to speak the good word of God and to do signs and miracles, the powers of the world to come. The world to come is the kingdom on earth. The hope of Israel is the resurrected Jesus Christ. He is also the hope for the body of Christ, because if he has not risen then our sins would not be paid for, our faith useless, and we will not be resurrected either. Paul wrote, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 17 to 20. All people are resurrected, but all will not go to the same place. Incredibly, the author of Hebrews, God, is teaching the believing remnant how to study his word through this letter. 
During the tribulation, God will bring their attention to the scriptures they will need to believe and obey. Many people even grace believers make the error of thinking Paul wrote Hebrews. But Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4 clearly prove that Paul did not write it. What does it mean to put him to open shame? Why did God swear in Genesis 22 verse 16 to give Abraham multiple descendants like the stars, and sand if he had already made that promise in Genesis 15 verse 5? What promise did Abraham receive? How long did Abraham wait for his promised son to be born? What is an oath? And underscore 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 is our hope. What are the different soils and what is the fruit? What does fall away mean and who are the heirs of promise? What is the anchor of the soul? Will the glorified Israelites have babies in the kingdom? When did the father make his son his high priest? 6. 1. Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. 3. And this will we do, if God permit. This paragraph began in 511, where the writer wanted to tell them many things about their high priest, but they were dull of hearing. Therefore, leaving the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, the basic, milk doctrine in 512, let us move on to solid food, the advanced doctrine in Hebrews, the strong meat in 514. So far, the writer has covered the superiority of the person of Christ. He is better than the angels, better than Moses and better than Aaron. Now he wants them to go on to perfection, advanced teaching regarding the accomplishments of the Son, as their high priest, and his sacrifice of himself. There is a sense of urgency to communicate this advanced truth. Jesus Christ said the spirit of truth would tell them more. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore, said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall shew it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again, a little while, the tribulation, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father, John 16 verses 12 to 16. The Spirit of Truth is speaking to them in the Hebrew epistles. The writer lists six principal doctrines of Christ that they should already know. 1. Let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works, turning to Christ's blood sacrifice and from animal sacrifice. 2. Of faith toward God, faith that his son Jesus Christ has paid with his blood. 3. The doctrines of baptisms, plural. There are many baptisms in the Bible. John the Baptist mentioned three baptisms water, the Holy Ghost, and fire, in Matthew 3 verse 11. Water baptism is necessary for salvation in Israel's program. The Jews must water baptize, or they cannot be a kingdom of priests, Mark 16 verse 16, Acts 2 verse 38, 1 Peter 3 verse 21, Ezekiel 36 verse 25. Water baptism ceremony is a sign of spiritual cleansing. 4. Jesus had laid on hands to heal the sick, Luke 4 verse 40, the apostles also performed the laying on of hands to heal people impart the Holy Ghost, and prophecy over others. But in the dispensation of grace we go to the doctor. 5. The Resurrection of the Dead While on earth Jesus said that all people will be resurrected. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation, John 5 verses 28 and 29. It is good to believe and evil not to believe. 6. The Father has committed eternal judgment to the Son, John 5 verse 22. The lost will be eternally judged at the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. The writer is anxious to proceed to the advanced teaching in Hebrews and share the deeper things they need to know. This of go on we will do if God permit, means if God has helped them understand the basics. He just reviewed the basic understanding the believing remnant should already know which will allow them to move on to the knowledge the writer of Hebrews will now reveal to them. 
4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, 5. And have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, 6. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. It is impossible if you have received the knowledge of these things, if you fall away to recover yourselves to right standing in the eyes of God. The remnant that the writer belongs to were enlightened at or after Pentecost by the believers in Christ's earthly ministry, Peter's group, 2 colon 3, 4. Paul was not saved until Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, so he could not have written Hebrews. In one long sentence, the writer tells them that it is impossible to have another chance of salvation if they squander the salvation they have already received. He lists five results of their faith after they experienced his spirit poured out on Pentecost. For it is impossible for those who were, one, once enlightened, who believed Jesus the Messiah and his followers, two, and have tasted of the heavenly gift of the Christs of truth, three, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost empowered by receiving the indwelling Holy Ghost, four, and have tasted the good word of God, the gospel of the kingdom, five, and the powers of the world to come, the kingdom powers of spiritual gifts, tongues, miracles, healing, etc., if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to open shame, Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6. They will not have another chance to change their mind and believe that Christ is their Messiah if they fall away. This is their one and only chance. They have the ball and must run it across the finish line into the end zone without fumbling the ball. What does fall away mean? The same Greek word that is used for forsake Moses in Acts 21 verse 21 is fall away in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. To fall away is to forsake the Son of God's sacrifice of himself for them. It is to stop believing in Jesus. For it is impossible if they fall away from believing in Jesus Christ as their Messiah King and obeying him and take the mark to renew them again to repentance. They can lose their salvation and not get it back if they take the mark of the beast. They sin if they reject the sacrifice of Christ's precious blood and offer animal sacrifices, or if they believe that their own works will be acceptable to God like Cain, if they worship Antichrist, or if they take the mark of the beast so they can buy and sell and eat, when God has strictly told them not to do so Revelation 13 verses 16 to 18. If they take the mark, then they have sealed their doom. God will not save, forgive, them again. Christ already warned them in the Hebrew epistles, Hebrews to Revelation, not take the mark of the beast, Rev 14 11, 16 2, 19 20, 20 4. They cannot say, I have the Holy Ghost, so I will take the mark of the beast so I can eat, and I will still be resurrected. No, they have to endure to the end, they are not under grace but the law. They would crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put what he had done for them to open shame. What does it mean to put him to open shame? The Son has already shed his blood for them when he died for them, and he is not going to go through with the shame of the cross again, being crucified by his own nation, although all mankind contributed the sin that made his death necessary. To expect him to die for them again, or for them to take the mark, would be an insult to his work on the cross for them, 10.29. They should not fall away from truth into unbelief after they have heard that Jesus the Son of God is the name of their Messiah, who came the first time, and suffered for them and later sent the Holy Ghost, Acts 4 verse 12. Although the rejection of the renewed offer of the kingdom, by the Holy Ghost speaking through Peter's group that culminated in the stoning of Stephen, in Acts 7, was the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, Matt 12 31, 32. Now in the tribulation, there is a similar condition from which they cannot be renewed to repentance, taking the mark of the beast is also unforgivable. John said, There is a sin unto death, 1 John 5 verse 16. It will be too late to be saved. God will not change his mind about paying them back with his vengeance. The writer is speaking to the future Hebrew little flock believers and also warning them. Those who believe that Paul wrote Hebrews have real problems with many passages which warn the Hebrews that they can lose their salvation, Heb 4 11, 6 colon 4, 10 26, 31, 39. There are also passages concerning the loss of salvation in the other Hebrew epistles, James 5 verse 12, 2 Peter 1 10, 2 20, 3 17, 1 John 2 verse 24, 2 John 8, 
Jude 21, Revelation 3 verse 16. But believers in the dispensation of grace cannot lose their salvation for we are sealed unto the day of redemption, Rom 5 colon 1, 5 17, 8 colon 31 dash 39, Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14 for 30. Only Paul taught the eternal security of the believer in mystery. The body of Christ is sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto his glory, Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14. The people of Israel and the land of Israel are also the Lord's possession, in fact, all heaven and earth are his. Israel is to be a theocracy, ruled by God, 2 Chronicles 19 verses 5 to 11. This warning is to believers in Jesus Christ in prophecy that they can fall away through unbelief or sin and lose their salvation. The need for both groups to rightly divide is evident. 7 For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God, 8 But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. The writer alludes to both the parable of the sower and the parables of the tares. If they have receptive hearts, good earth, to God's word they will receive a blessing, otherwise they should prepare to be rejected, cursed, and burned. For the earth a good ground or heart, which drinketh in the rain, Holy Ghost that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, the seed is the word of righteousness, 513, meat fitting for them by whom it is dressed, prepared, receiveth blessing from God. Their hearts should be prepared like the good soil in the parable of the sower Matt, 13,3-23, and drink in what God tells them in Hebrews and receive a blessing. Their hearts are either good soil that receives the good doctrine that produces wheat, or bad soil with false doctrine that produces thorns and briars. Weeds like thorns and briars, prickly shrubs similar to wild roses, did not exist until in the Garden of Eden when God pronounced a curse on the ground, Genesis 3 verses 17 and 19. God did not want to leave creation perfect for Satan and sinful men. But that worthless ground, which beareth thorns and briars, words of unrighteousness, is rejected of false doctrine from an evil heart of unbelief in what God said are rejected weeds, tares, and is nigh unto cursing, about ready to be cursed, whose end is to be burned cast into a furnace of fire and burned eternally. The writer of Hebrews alluded to the parable of the tares, when he wrote, whose end is to be burned, they will be gathered and thrown into the furnace of fire, Matt, 1342, and suffer eternal damnation, Matt, 13,24-30, 30, 36-43. Examples of tares are Ananias and Saphira, who were struck dead for lying to the Holy Ghost in Acts 5 verses 3-5. Peter is an example of wheat. Tares are weeds that resemble wheat. Outwardly they look and sound like believing Jews, but in their hearts, they reject Christ and are still in Adam and dead in their sins. They would not have lied to the Holy Ghost if they were his. In the kingdom, Christ will rule the nations with a rod of iron, Revelation 2 verse 27. It is difficult for a man to judge who is a true believer by appearances, but God knows. We cannot fake it with God. There are four types of ground in Luke, the wayside, rock, thorns, and good ground. It is important to receive the word of God into their heart and understand it, so they can produce the fruit of faith, understand, and do what God said. The seed is the word of God in Luke, but it is the word of the kingdom in Matthew. The Lord Jesus used the words, fall away, in the parable of the sower, and Christ explained the different soils. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they, which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away, Luke 8 verses 11 to 13. Asterisk note that the Lord said it is possible for those who believe for a while, but have no root, the word of God is not deep in their heart, to fall away, when temptation comes, hunger and governmental pressure, to leave the truth and take the mark. And that which fell among thorns are they, which, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience, understand, and do what God said, Luke 8 verses 14 and 15. They have to keep the word to enter the kingdom. They are warned to have a heart of belief, 
good ground or soil, because only the heart that produces fruit will enter the kingdom. Asterisk only one in four of the soils in the parable of the sower will be saved. The word of God will equip them to get through the tribulation and into the kingdom. In Matthew, the Lord Jesus said, But he that receives seed of the word of the kingdom, Matt, 13.19, into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth, some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, Matt, 13.23. Fruit is required for entering the kingdom. Jesus said, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful, Matt, 13.22. Jesus said in the parables of the tares, Let both of the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers his angels, Matt. 13.39, Gather ye together first the tares of the children of the wicked one, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat good seed into my barn of the kingdom, Matt. 13.30. In prophecy, it is good to be left behind, but it is not good to be left behind at the rapture in mystery. 9 But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. The writer calls them beloved, he says, we, because they both belong to the little flock. The writers of Hebrews to Revelation were the little flock followers of Christ's earthly ministry, James, Peter, John, and Jude. The Holy Ghost empowered them to preach, teach, and write the word of God by the Spirit of Christ working in them. They are persuaded better things of them, that they will have believing hearts to God's word, good soil, and do the things that accompany salvation. In prophecy, works accompany salvation. That they will have a heart that receive, and do the things we tell you, though we felt the need to warn you sternly. They have to believe and do works such as be water baptized in Israel's program, and endure to the end, but the body of Christ just needs to believe. The law says do, but grace says done. Next, the writer states what the better things they hope and pray for them are. 10 For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have shewed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. 11 And we desire that every one of you do shew the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. 12 That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The good fruit, herbs, is further explained in this verse. They are already showing good works and doing what God said, which is the fruit of faith in them. It is a fact that God is not going to be unrighteous to forget their work and labor of love, which they have shown toward his name. They have shared the truth with others, they have ministered to the saints, they have resisted the mark and suffered for the name of Christ and do minister. The writer says we desire that every one of you continue to show the same diligence to share his word, and the gospel so others will also have the assured hope of entering into the kingdom, at the end of the tribulation when Christ their high priest returns 3 colon 6 14. They want all of them to have hearts of faith to the end. Keep ministering until the end. Continue to serve God and his people, by being diligent to share the truth of the gospel, and have fruit, other believers. Be patient and endure so you can receive the promises. We believe that none of you will be slothful, lazy, those who rest before the work is done, and are also negligent in their study of God's word, but followers of them, that through faith, in what God said, and patience serving while waiting for Christ to return, will inherit the promises in the kingdom. The other, heirs of salvation Peter's group in early Acts, and also the little flock believers in the tribulation inherit the promises. They should follow the little flock believers living now and those faithful in the past so they can also enter into the kingdom. Peter's group was a believing remnant, Romans 11 verse 5, that was sanctified by the indwelling Holy Ghost. There are parallels between mystery and prophecy because by one cross, Christ saved two groups. There are two groups that have the Holy Ghost, one, the redeemed of Israel, the little flock, and two, the body of Christ. The little flock was sanctified by having the Holy Ghost before the body of Christ. The glorified Lord Jesus told Paul, Delivering thee from the people unbelieving Israel, and from the Gentiles unbelieving Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee speaking to Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, to open their eyes the Gentiles, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified, 
The little flock Peter's group by faith that is in me sanctified by Christ's faith to keep the law perfectly, and his spirit in them, Acts 26 verses 17 and 18. The body of Christ is also indwelt by Christ, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, Colossians 1 verse 27. They should follow the remnant that began in Christ's earthly ministry, and that continues after our rapture. 13 For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, 14 saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. 15 And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Therefore, God made a promise to Abraham, and since there is no one greater than God, he swore by himself. And said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies Genesis 22 verses 16 and 17. God made his nation of Israel from Abraham, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. What promise did Abraham receive? God promised to multiply thee through his promised son Isaac. The writer refers to the Lord's oath to Abraham, after he was willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to the Lord. What is an oath? An oath is a solemn affirmation or declaration, made with an appeal to God for the truth of what is affirmed. A person swears to God and invokes the vengeance of God if he should fail to fulfill his promise. A false oath is called perjury. Zedekiah committed perjury, 2 Chronicles 36 verse 13. Abraham demonstrated in his heart that God knew, and by his actions that he loved God more than his long-awaited son. How long did Abraham wait for his promised son to be born? Abraham waited 40 years for his promised son, Isaac. 40 is the number of testings. Abraham had to patiently wait his son that was born when he was 100 years old. God called Abram out of Mesopotamia when he was 60 years old, then he lived in Haran until his father Terah died 15 years later. He was 75 when God made the Abrahamic covenant with him, Gen 11 32, 12 colon 1 4, Acts 7 verse 2. All the promises were God's. Abraham believed and obeyed God. Abraham's people, the nation, would be blessed and multiplied. The Lord swore by himself to Abraham, after Abraham proved his faith in God by not withholding, but willingly offering up his son, his only son. When he was tried, his faith was tested, Abraham trusted that God could raise Isaac to life again from the dead, 11.17-19. The Lord said that he would bless and multiply his descendants, because he obeyed, my voice, Genesis 22 verse 18. After he had patiently endured the trial of his faith, the offering up of his son, then Abraham received the promise, Genesis 22 verses 16 and 17, James 2 verses 20 to 24. James said that Abraham proved his faith by his works, James 2 verse 23. A man's faith in prophecy requires works, but the body of Christ believers are saved without works by trusting in Christ's faith, believing in what Christ has done by his faithfulness, Galatians 2 verse 16. Likewise, the tribulation saints will be blessed after they have patiently endured. Why did God swear in Genesis 22 verse 16 to give Abraham multiple descendants like the stars, and sand if he had already made that promise in Genesis 15 verse 5? God made the oath for their sake, the sake of the heirs of promise, so they could be absolutely certain of their eternal life in the kingdom, when they are facing the terrible, terrifying events in the tribulation. Furthermore, in Genesis 15 verse 5 God only mentioned the stars, not the sand. God has multiplied Israel, but he will spend eternity making them as plentiful as the stars and sand. God acknowledged Abraham's faithfulness after Abraham proved his faith by his actions, works. It was then that God confirmed his promise by an oath so they would have the courage to make it through the tribulation without any doubt. Furthermore, the typology of Jesus Christ remained intact. 1. Isaac, a type of Christ, was obedient unto death. Philosophy 2.5-8 2. Abraham was a type of the father who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Romans 8 verse 32 3. The ram was a type of substitution. But a ram is not a lamb. 
This means Abraham's prophecy was not fulfilled at that time. God did what he said and provided himself as the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God, sacrificed in Isaac's place, Genesis 22 verse 8. Christ was offered on the cross as a burnt offering in the place of his people, Hebrews 10 verses 5 to 10. 4. Hebrews chapter 11 confirms the type of Christ's resurrection, from the dead, he received him in a figure, Hebrews 11 verses 17 to 19. Israel crucified the Lord Jesus in unbelief, had they believed, they would have bound the son and sacrificed him as Abraham did with Isaac. Every Passover they sang the psalm that says, bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar, Psalm 118 verse 27. Abraham told his young men, abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you, Genesis 22 verse 5. Once on top of the mountain, Abraham bound his son by faith, and placed him on the wood, and was ready to slit his throat like a sacrificial lamb knowing God would raise him from the dead. Isaac was the promised seed. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Abraham prophesied, So, they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood, Genesis 22 verses 6 to 9. The angel of the Lord spoke to Abraham twice. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now, I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, Genesis 22 verses 10 to 14. In that mount the lamb the Lord provided was seen. That mount was Mount Moriah the same mountain chain, on which the temple in Jerusalem was, and on which the Lord Jesus was crucified, 2 Chronicles 3 verse 1. The Dome of the Rock, an Islamic sanctuary, is on the site of the second temple, which was destroyed in AD 70, is said to cover the rock which was the foundation stone under the Ark of the Covenant in the Most Holy Place, and also, the place that Abraham offered Isaac. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba, Genesis 22 verses 15 to 19. A ram is not a lamb. God did provide himself a lamb. The Lord Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, John 1 verse 29. The Godhead provided a costly salvation for mankind. Abraham proved his faith by his works, and so should the tribulation saints. They are Abraham's seed, which will be multiplied like the stars, and sand in the eternal kingdom. The Gentiles will serve them, and help take care of their children in the kingdom. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord. For they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Isaiah 49 verses 22 and 23. These children may have been saved along with them during the tribulation, because the Lord made it clear that the glorified saint would not have children in the kingdom. 
Adam and Eve were also commanded to be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 1 verse 22. Because there is often a parallel between Israel's program and the body of Christ, children are not likely to be born in the heavenly places either. The statement of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 22 verse 30 is very puzzling. Abraham is the father of both groups which are both Abraham's seed, Romans for verses 12 and 16. Abraham had to patiently endure the hardship of being willing to offer his only begotten son of promise, and the tribulation saints must be patient to endure to the end. The kingdom saints have to prove their faith by their works. Abraham received a blessing and promise from God after his faith was tested. God promised to multiply Abraham. Abraham proved that he had faith in God and believed his word, and loved God by his actions. Abraham is an example of one that was blessed after he patiently endured. Isaac is an example of one that was obedient unto death. The first mention of Hebrew is Abram the Hebrew, Genesis 14 verse 13. When the tribulation saints faith is tried will they be obedient unto death? There is very much information in the Bible devoted to helping the tribulation saints. 16 For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Mortal men truly swear by God who is greater, and an oath confirms a promise or covenant or agreement or peace treaty between men that settles or ends disputes war. Elijah swore by the Lord, 1 Kings 18 verse 15, dot. 17 Wherein God, willing more abundantly to shew unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, 18 that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold the hope set before us, 19 which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which ent wrath into that within the veil, 20 whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest. Forever after the order of Melchizedek, God was willing more abundantly to show the heirs of promise by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, that he would keep his word. 1. He swore by himself because there is none greater than God and 2. By his word which God has magnified above his name, for thou hast magnified thy word above thy name, Psalms 138 verse 2. So that we, the believing remnant, would have a strong consolation, absolute assurance. God made the oath for the sake of the heirs of promise. The heirs of salvation, 114, are the heirs of promise, the believing remnant of Israel, the little flock, those saved before and after the dispensation of grace. The promise is to them too because they are also the seed of Abraham. God swore by an oath so that they could be absolutely certain he would keep his word to them. That they would have eternal life and be multiplied in the kingdom, there are a lot of stars in the sky and grains of sand on the seashore. They have fled for refuge in Jesus Christ, not a tower or city, Numbers 35 verse 28, Deuteronomy 19 verse 6, Josh 20 colon 9, 1 John 2 verse 1, so they can lay hold upon the hope set before them of the promises of resurrection to eternal life and reigning with him in the kingdom. Paul told Timothy the same thing for the body of Christ, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. God will say to the heirs for promise in the kingdom, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising, Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 3. The believing Jews had the Holy Ghost in bodies of flesh, but at Christ's return, Isaiah 66 verse 14, they will have glorified bodies. The Gentiles will not receive glorified bodies until after the millennial reign is over and Satan has been released for a time to purge out the rebels from them. In the future, God will populate heaven and earth with glorified believers that have the spirit of the Son in them, but their souls will be unique. They are kept by their faith in his word rightly divided, they are not to follow Paul and demonstrate their faith by believing and doing what God told them. Paul identified just who Christ came to minister to when he came in the flesh. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and his twelve sons Romans 15 verse 8. They have the hope of being multiplied in the kingdom for eternity because of Christ. 
God not only swore by two immutable things to Abraham, himself and his word, but he also swore an oath to his son regarding him being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By his oath, God was willing more abundantly than a man's oath, to show unto the heirs of promise who will inherit the kingdom in the promised land the immutability, unchangeableness, of his counsel, what he has agreed to do. He swore so we might have a strong consolation of absolute reliability and assurance in their resurrection to eternal life in the kingdom, which is what Abraham believed, that God was able to raise his son. This hope of eternal life is sure, certain, and steadfast, dependable, because of their high priest's sacrifice and resurrection. Tradition, not the Bible, says that there was a rope tied to the high priest's leg, so he could be pulled out of the most holy place if he was struck dead by God. His resurrection is the anchor of their soul. They can trust his work and his word which is like the rope of the anchor that is both sure and steadfast. The anchor is inside the true veil of the real holiest place of all in heaven. Jesus Christ their forerunner has already laid hold of eternal life. The forerunner, Jesus Christ as Israel's high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, has entered into the holiest place of all before them. Jesus their high priest is the anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, the anchor holds, which entreth into that within the veil. Their forerunner and high priest have entered in behind the veil, and so will the nation of priests. The nation of priests has the hope of entering into the presence of God, just like their high priest. Their high priest is after the eternal unchanging order of Melchizedek, and untouchable. His priesthood and sacrifice of his own blood are absolutely reliable. They will also be able to enter God's presence. Their high priest's entrance behind the veil is an anchor of their soul. He will get them through the tribulation and into the kingdom. They will follow their high priest in behind the veil. By two immutable things, they will gain their hope of eternal life in the kingdom. If they will take hold of him their eternal life in the kingdom is sure, certain, and steadfast, unmovable, which God who cannot lie has promised. Their forerunner, Jesus Christ the high priest, on behalf of his priests and people has already entered within the veil to make atonement for them. The anchor of their souls during the tribulation is their high priest. Underscore 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 is our hope. Their hope is the Lord Jesus Christ, and our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 1 verse 1. The hope of Israel is the resurrected Jesus Christ. The resurrected Jesus Christ is also the hope for the body of Christ, because if he has not risen then our sins would not be paid for, our faith useless, and we will not be resurrected either. Paul wrote, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 17 to 20. At the end of the tribulation, their hope is their king at his second coming returning down to earth from heaven. Our blessed hope for the body of Christ is the return of Jesus Christ for us in the air to catch us up to live with him in heaven. Down and up are two different things. Just like heaven and earth are two separate places. Their entrance is assured because their high priest has entered in, within the veil, to the holiest place of all and made atonement with his blood. The body of Christ have atonement and eternal life upon salvation, Romans 5 verse 10. God made an oath by two immutable things so that his people would be certain that he would not change his mind. God will not change his mind about his promises. Just as Christ is the forerunner of an eternal priesthood, so will they. Jesus Christ will be the high priest of the nation of priests. Abraham knew Jesus would come, John 7 verse 39. Mount Olivet, Mount Moriah, and Mount Zion. How Christ Fulfilled the Sacrifices The Levitical Sacrifices Christ's Payment Burnt offering clean animal, male sheep, goat, bull, turtle doves, or young pigeon, completely burnt. All the sacrifices are offered with salt. Christ complete substitutionary blood atonement on the cross. The offering of Jesus Christ once for all, Hebrews 10 verse 10. Meat, grain meal, offering burned fine flour without leaven, oil, frankincense, cakes, wafers, or green heads of grain.
He was holy and without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15. Peace offering voluntary offering of unblemished male or female cattle, sheep or goats. Christ willingly voluntarily offered his unblemished self and made peace between God and men possible. Heb 8 colon 6, 12 24, 1 John 2 verse 1. Sin offering a bull for the high priest, a young bull for the congregation, a male goat for a ruler, a female goat of lamb for the common people. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, Heb 9.28 a.m. Trespass offering, Leviticus 5.16, 6 colon 5. Blood of a ram and restitution of the value plus on fifth, 20%. Poor could bring two pigeons or two turtle doves, even poorer could bring fine flour. He never trespassed against God's word. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens Hebrews 7 verse 26. All the sacrifices the Lord told Moses about pointed to Jesus Christ, yet Israel missed it. Chapter 7 A Better Priesthood After Melchizedek, Not Aaron 7 colon 1 3 The king priest Melchizedek was a type of the Son of God. 7 colon 4 10 Abraham honored Melchizedek with a tithe. 7 colon 11 22 Aaron's priesthood was imperfect, so it was changed. 7 colon 23 28 The Levitical priests died continually, but he lives forevermore. Just as Romans is the foundational doctrine for the body of Christ, Hebrews will be the foundational book for the world to come after the rapture. Hebrews informs Israel's believing remnant of the changes in God's program for them since Christ's sacrificial death for their sins on the cross. The writer can now begin to tell them the further advanced revelation of Christ's accomplishments on Calvary and in heaven after his resurrection and ascension. He is thrilled to tell them about his eternal priesthood, the new covenant, and his sacrifice of himself, that he offered once because that is all it took to save them to the uttermost. There is a swap or switch in this chapter in 7 colon 3 Melchizedek is like the sun, but in 715 the sun is like Melchizedek. Christ and the new covenant is better than Aaron and the old covenant. Before he died, King David organized his kingdom as instructed by God. One of the things he did was to divide the priests into 24 courses that served for two weeks every year, 1 Chronicles 24 verses 1 to 19. John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, in the eighth course of Abia, was on duty by lot, when Gabriel met him at the altar of incense and told him he would have a son, Luke 1 verses 5 and 13. There will be a final rebellion by some Gentiles after Christ's 1000 year reign, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 9. Why did God change the Aaronic priesthood? What does Melchizedek mean? Does a change in the priesthood necessitate a change in the law? What does the here and there mean in verse 7 colon 8? What does shorty mean? What does save them to the uttermost that come to God by him mean? What does carnal commandment mean? Will the Gentiles receive glorified bodies in the kingdom like the Jews? What will happen to Satan? 7 colon 1 for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, two to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, three without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, Abedeth a priest continually. In the last verse of chapter 6, Jesus is the forerunner because he has been perfected by his suffering, resurrected in a glorified body, and entered in behind the veil. The writer will now begin to tell them several reasons why the priesthood of Jesus after the order of Melchizedek is better than Aaron's. Why did God make his son the high priest after the order of Melchizedek? For Melchizedek, king of Salem, Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham after he returned from slaughtering the kings that had kidnapped Lot and his household and others, blessed Abraham. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, who in turn honored Melchizedek with a tenth portion of all the spoil. Melchizedek when translated means king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, Shalom. Asterisk notice the time sequence, and after that also king of Salem, 
First Christ suffered and died for their sin and rose, then when Christ returns, the Prince of Peace will be the King of Peace in his Kingdom of Peace, Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7. Then what the angels said to the shepherds at his birth will be fulfilled glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, Luke 2 verse 14. Melchizedek, king of Salem, was priest of the Most High God, so this priest king of Jerusalem worshipped Abraham's God. Salem is the word shalom or peace in Hebrew. Asterisk notice the capital K in king. Melchizedek's historic existence indicates that some Gentiles were still worshippers of the Most High God the possessor of heaven and earth, and they were not all part of the idolaters at the Tower of Babel. He was not Shem because Shem had parents. It is possible that Melchizedek may have been the pre-incarnate Christ. The Holy Ghost-inspired writer of Hebrews expounds on the text, and added the capital letters and the part about King of Righteousness. Jesus Christ is King of Righteousness and King of Peace. Jesus will rule with righteous judgments, Psalm 72 verses 7 and 8, Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7, Luke 1 verse 33, Revelation 11 verse 15. Like him, Jesus is King Priest in one person. And Melchizedek King of Salem brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all, Genesis 14 verses 18 to 20. Remember that Jesus, who is the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, brought forth bread and wine at the Last Supper with his disciples. Melchizedek just arrives on the pages of scripture without any mention of his father or mother, or ancestor line. Melchizedek is similar to the Son of God, having a continual unchanging priesthood. He has no record of the beginning of his days, nor end of his life, thus Melchizedek was made like unto the eternal Son of God, Psalms 90 verses 1 and 2, Mike 5 colon 2, and established as a priest continually. Jesus Christ existed with God the Father before he was born. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory, which I had with thee before the world was, John 17 verse 5. His priesthood is eternal, it continues without interruption, and it will never end. The millennial kingdom is only the beginning of Christ's eternal reign. Jesus Christ is from everlasting. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is T.O. be ruler and of Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting, Micah 5 verse 2. Judah is the tribe that Israel's kings come from. This is the verse that the priests used to inform Herod the king that the king of the Jews was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem, from the tribe of Judah, Matt, 2 colon 2 6. It was primarily the children that were two and under of the tribe of Judah that Herod had them kill in Bethlehem. The psalmist wrote to the Lord who existed before he created anything. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, Psalms 90 verses 1 and 2. The Lord created the nation of Israel for a purpose of ruling with him in the earth, just like he created the body of Christ for his purpose to reign with him in heaven. The tribe of Judah is the tribe that kings come from. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5 verse 5. Just like their high priests after the order of Melchizedek is the king of righteousness and the king of peace, the believers in Israel will be both kings and priests. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth, Revelation 5 verse 10. Israel is going to be a theocracy under their monarch King Jesus. For now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. 5 And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. 6 But he Melchizedek, whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him Abraham, that had the promises. 7 And without all contradiction the less is blessed of the better. The writer now wants to show them the weaknesses of the Levitical priesthood, and for them to know the superiority of this other priesthood. He wants them to know that Christ and the new covenant is better than Aaron and the old covenant. 
The tribe of Levi assisted Aaron's family, also from the tribe of Levi, in the service of the temple. Now consider how great Melchizedek was to whom the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Melchizedek's priesthood was greater than that of Aaron's, and Abraham, the father of the nation, gave tithes to him. Their great father Abraham honored Melchizedek. He gave him a tenth because the king priest was greater than him. Abraham did not give a tenth of all that he possessed, just what he had gotten in that battle. It is true that the descendants of Levi that have received the office of the priesthood are commanded according to the law to take a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, the other tribes, though they also descended from the loins of Abraham. But he Melchizedek, whose descent is not counted from them, the tribe of Levi's lineage, received tithes of Abraham. Melchizedek was not a descendant of Levi, but he still received a tithe from Abraham. The genealogy was meticulously kept for the sake of the royal and legal line to Messiah, and the lineage of the priests, Nehemiah 12 verses 10 to 26. But in AD 70, when the second temple was destroyed, so were the genealogical records that were kept there, Ezra 8 verse 1. Obviously, Messiah had to be born before AD 70 so that his lineage could be confirmed as Jesus Christ's, is in Matthew 1 verses 1 to 16, Joseph's line, and in Luke 3 verses 23 to 38, Mary's father Heli's line. Luke traces Jesus' bloodline in reverse. In Matthew it is begot, but in Luke it is the son of. In Matthew's lineage, three idolaters are missing Ahaziah, Josh, and Amaziah, to make fourteen generations from Abraham to David, and fourteen generations from David to the Babylonian captivity, and fourteen generations from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ. Sinon is placed between Arphaxad and Sulla, in Luke to making it seventy-seven generations unto the perfect man. Our calendar began at the birth of Christ, B.C. means, before Christ, was born, and A.D. means, Anno Domini, Latin for in the years of our Lord. It has been about 2,021 years since Christ was born, but it has not yet been 2,000 since he died. The enemy wants to change the calendar. However, God knows which Jews belong to which tribe. Joseph's and Mary's lineage are the same from Abraham and Adam, and both came through Judah, Tamar, Perez, Hezron, Ram. But after David, Joseph's line goes through Solomon, while Mary's goes through Nathan. After the Babylonian slash Persian captivity, both descend from Salatiel to Zerubbabel, Zorobabel, but here is a fork for Joseph's line is through Abiad, while Mary's line is through Risa. After she gave birth to Jesus Christ, Mary had four sons James, Jose, Simon, and Judas, and at least two daughters by Joseph, Mark 6 verse 3. Levi begot Kohath that begot Amram that begot Aaron the brother of Moses, Exodus 6 verses 1 to 20. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine and personally blessed Abraham, who had the promises of the Abrahamic covenant from God, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 4. Without any contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. This principle of the lesser being blessed by the better was demonstrated by the father blessing the son, a king would bless his subjects. Jacob blessed Pharaoh that allowed him and his family a place to stay on the good land of Goshen in Egypt, Genesis 47 verse 10 according to the Abrahamic covenant. King David blessed and kissed Brazilla, 2 Samuel 19 verse 39. Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. Eight and here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. Furthermore, here those who are currently mortal, with the ability to die, priests in the temple, which was still operating when this letter was penned, receive tithes, but there in Genesis chapter 14, Melchizedek received a tithe as a witness that he lives continually. A continual unchanging priesthood existed before the Levitical priesthood. A tithe was the method whereby God proved Israel whether or not he would bless them materially or chastise them. For example, they either received rain and good crops or not. God has already proved his love and faithfulness to us in the body of Christ on Calvary. Paul does not ask the body of Christ to give a tithe anywhere in his letters. Furthermore, the body of Christ does not have priests, we have pastors, teachers, and ambassadors. 9 And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. 10 For he was yet in the loins of his father, when Melchizedek met him. Even Levi in a sense virtually honored Melchizedek through Abraham, whose priesthood preceded him, 
being Abraham's seed yet to be born as his great-grandson. 11 If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron? 12 For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. 13 For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. 14 For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Why did God have another different priest from Aaron's ordained in Psalm 110 verse 4? If therefore perfection could be attained by the Levitical priesthood, for under the Levitical priesthood the people received the law, the old covenant, what further need was there that another priest should rise from another order of Melchizedek, and not called after the order of Aaron? The imperfect Levitical priesthood could not bring in the perfection, and the once for all 1010, atonement for Israel. Therefore, it was necessary for God to change to a better priesthood. The change of the priesthood by God also corresponds to a need for a change in the law, from the old covenant to a new covenant. The Levitical sacrificial system could never permanently purge away their sins. Therefore, a better system was needed. He, Jesus, came from another tribe of whom the Father never spoke anything pertaining to the priesthood or in connection with the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, a tribe that Moses spoke nothing about concerning the priesthood, Mike, 5 colon 2, Matt, 2 colon 1 dot. 15 And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, 16 who is made, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. 17 For he testifieth, Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. In 7 colon 3 Melchizedek is like the sun, in 715 the sun is like Melchizedek. It is even far more evident, for after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is similar to Melchizedek, eternal. Jesus was not made a high priest after the law of carnal commandments, the earthly physical old covenant mosaic law, but after the power of an endless life, the eternal life of Melchizedek. Just as the Father testified with an oath after his Son sat down on his right hand in heaven. The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent, thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek, Psalms 110 verse 4. When did the Father make his Son his high priest? After his Son sat down on his right hand. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent, Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek, Psalms 110 verse 4. God knew that the carnal sinful people that descended from Adam and inherited Adam's sin nature or Romans 5 verse 12, would not be able to keep the perfect law, the Ten Commandments. But God needed to let them try, so that he could prove that they needed his spirit in them. The priesthood being changed signified the need for the law to be changed. The constitution for the kingdom given in Christ's Sermon on the Mount as recorded in Matthew 5-7, has a higher standard than the original law given to Moses. They will be able to keep the new covenant by the power of an endless life, because it imparts his endless life, his spirit in them. In the past, only the tribe of Levi were to be the priests, but in the kingdom the whole nation of believers will be priests under Christ's priesthood, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. The priesthood of Jesus Christ is better than Aaron, and the new covenant is better than the old covenant. The heirs of promise will have an eternal priesthood like their forerunner under a new covenant. 18 For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. The old covenant was to be replaced after the father changed the priesthood according to another order. For there is truly a disannulling, dissolution, cancellation, discontinuing, replacing, abolishing of the covenant that went before. Because the old covenant was weak and unprofitable, the weak flesh in humans could not keep the law. The law did not profit them because the law had no power to save a person or to give life. There was nothing wrong with God's law, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good Romans 7 verse 12, but the problem was that sinful men with the sin nature in their flesh inherited from Adam, could not keep the old covenant Romans 5 verse 12. Jesus Christ kept the old covenant law perfectly. With Christ's Spirit in them, under the New Covenant, they will be able to keep the New Covenant. 
19 for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. The law was weak and had no power to save anyone or to make them holy before God. They need a new hope, a new law that could profit them. The new covenant is the better hope. There was no power in the law to make anyone perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope, the new covenant, did, by which hope they are able to draw nigh near to God. Nothing unholy can stand before God, but with his spirit in them, and the law written on their hearts, not on cold stones, so they know and keep it, they can come before the Holy Father. In the kingdom, all the believing remnants will be saved and become a nation of priests, not just the tribe of Levi. Just like God originally told Israel at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. The fulfillment of Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 is that the believing remnant will become a holy priesthood, 1 Peter 2 verses 5 to 10. They will be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy, 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10, compare with Hosea 2 verse 23, Romans 9 verses 25 and 26, dot. 20 and inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, 21, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear, and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 22 By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. The Father made his Son high priest with an oath that could not be broken or changed, but the Aaronic priesthood was not made by an oath from God. Verse 21 is in parenthesis. The writer repeatedly repeats and drills from Psalm 110 verse 4 so that they can understand and prepare for the change that God is making in their program. He is teaching what God said in the scriptures, one step at a time, so that they will learn to study his word for themselves. The Lord swore, and he will not change his mind about appointing his son their high priest forever. The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In keeping with the oath's greater strength, the son became the guarantee of a stronger and more excellent covenant. The writer stresses that this oath made Jesus a surety of a better testament, the new covenant. Someone that is surety, is someone that has co-signed a document for someone else saying he will be responsible to make sure the entire debt is paid. Jesus Christ is a surety, a down payment, a sure guarantee, or pledge of payment on behalf of another, who secures a better testament, the new covenant. Proverbs warns against making a deal, and shaking hands as surety for a stranger, PROV 6 colon 1, 1115, 2016, but God did it for his people. The Son ratified the New Testament with his own blood. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, Matt, 26 colon 28. God is not going to change his mind about the new priesthood and new covenant. 23 And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death, 24 But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. 25 Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The Levitical priests were many, and they could not continue, as priests, for an exceedingly long for the reason that humans suffer death. The Aaronic priesthood was limited to twenty years of service, from age thirty to fifty, Numbers 4 verse 3, and not continuous, because humans die. But this man, Jesus has an unchangeable eternal priesthood, for this reason he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The Son never stops interceding for them, and his eternal priesthood by an oath will never be changed like Aaron's was. For this reason, he is able to save to the uttermost that come unto God by him in faith. Their sins are not just covered for a year, or the lifetime of a human, but every second for all eternity since he lives forever to make intercession for them. His priesthood and our, the Hebrews, priesthood will never change again. Just after Jehovah God had delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage, he made the children of Israel a proposal at Mount Sinai. If his people kept the covenant law perfectly, then they could then be a nation of priests. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, 
and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. The destiny of the Hebrews is to be a kingdom of priests. Peter said they are a royal priesthood serving their priest king, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Currently, the job for the body of Christ is to be ambassadors. After our rapture then God will concentrate on his future priests. After the tribulation, in the kingdom, the glorified Jews will preach to the Gentiles. The Father's plan is to give his Son, and all that believe in him eternal glorified bodies that will live forever. However, when Christ returns only the believing Jews will receive glorified bodies. Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit during the millennium. Satan will be loosed for a season, and there will be a final rebellion after Christ's 1,000-year reign, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 9. What will happen to Satan? After Christ's 1,000-year reign, Satan will be loosed for a season to remove any rebels. A multitude of Gentiles from the four quarters of the earth will rebel and be drawn away by Satan. The devil and his Gentile forces will surround Jerusalem and battle against King Jesus and his people. God will destroy the opposition with fire from heaven. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and compass the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 9. The devil is thrown into the lake of fire. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast Antichrist and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20 verse 10. The Gentiles who remain faithful to Christ will have the opportunity to have eternal bodies by eating the leaves of the tree of life, for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22 verse 2. Dot. 26 For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, 27 who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's, for this he did once, when he offered up himself. This is the kind of high priest that is suitable for us to have. We needed one who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, not one of them, and made higher than the heavens exalted far above the heavens by the Father. One who does not need to daily, as those human high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people. The Son is sitting on the right hand of the Father, and does not need to offer any more sacrifice for sin, for this he did once, when he offered up himself. The Son, Jesus Christ, is not only their high priest, but he was also the sacrifice. Christ offered up himself once, and that was on the cross. He only needed to offer himself once because that is all it took. He lived a perfect life and died a perfect death. Hell could not hold an innocent man, Acts 2 verse 24. His sacrifice fully satisfied the Father, Isaiah 53 verse 11. He was the fully satisfying blood sacrifice. All the sacrifices that the Lord told Moses about, and that they had been making for thousands of years, all pointed to Jesus Christ, yet they missed him when he came. 28 For the law mocketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, mocketh the Son, who is consecrated for evermore. The law in the five books of Moses, there were six hundred and thirteen laws, made men which had infirmities, sinful weaknesses, high priests, but the word of the oath, which was spoken in Psalms after the law, about five hundred years after by the Holy Ghost through David, made his son the high priest forever. The oath of the Father consecrated, perfected, set apart to God, his son as his eternal high priest forevermore. The Son will always be their high priest. The writer is showing them who Jesus their priest king is, and what he has done, and how that has changed how they should worship God after the cross, during the tribulation. They can be certain of their future hope, his second coming and their reign with him in the kingdom, Rev 1 colon 6, 20 colon 6, dot. Melchizedek blessed Abraham who gave a tithe. Facts about tithing. 1. A tithe is a tenth part, 10%. If a person has 40 goats, he would give 4. 2. Paying a tithe, a tenth, to the Levi priests was mandatory, Amos for verses 4 and 5. 
3. A tithe was given to support the priesthood and government, not the local church. Aaron's sons had no inheritance or land because their inheritance was the Lord. They served as Israel's government and in the temple, Numbers 18 verses 21 to 32, Nehemiah 10 verses 37 and 38, 12 44, Hebrews 7 verses 4 to 9. 4. A tithe was an essentially tax paid to Israel's government. 5. A tithe did not always involve money, Leviticus 27 verses 3 to 34, Nehemiah 13 verses 5 and 31. The Jews gave 10% of their produce, wood, grain, vegetables, fruit, and livestock. If he wanted to convert the animal to money, he had to sell it and add 20% to the price and give the entire amount to the priest. 6. The tithe was brought to the tabernacle and placed into the storehouse or of the priests, Deuteronomy 26 verse 12, 2 Chronicles 31 verses 11 and 12, Nehemiah 10 verses 31 to 39, Malachi 3 verses 8 to 11. 7. There were additional tithes besides the 10%. Jewish males were required to travel to the temple three times a year, for three feasts, or holy days, Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles as mentioned in Leviticus 23, Exodus 23 verses 14 to 19. Deuteronomy 16 verse 16. In order to fund their trip and pay for their expenses, they were instructed to set aside an additional 10% of the net income, after the first tithe, Deuteronomy 14 verses 22 to 26. This second tithe was optional. There was a third type of tithe that supported the welfare system in Israel, Deuteronomy 14 verses 28 and 29, 26 colon 12. This third tithe was voluntary but was given every three years. Therefore, had a Jew given all tithes annually, it was not just 10%, but another 10% plus 3, and one thirds percent, or an additional 13.33% to the two 10% or 23.33% nearly 25% every year. 8. The second temple was destroyed in AD 70 by a Roman invasion, and Israel's priesthood stopped. There is no longer a temple to bring the tithe to. 9. The priests lived on the tithes and by eating some of the sacrifices. 10. The body of Christ is not under any tithes. A collection was taken to help the poor kingdom saints in Jerusalem after God interrupted their program. But that group died out in the first century since they agreed not to accept any new converts, Galatians 2 verses 7 to 9. Still, God loves a cheerful giver that is willing to communicate, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 7, Galatians 6 verse 6, 4 verse 14, 1 Timothy 6 verse 18, resources to support the his ministry, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. There is no priesthood in the dispensation of grace. The Bible, read it, study it, apply it, and live it out. This is the end of part 5 Missing the Rapture. Jacob's Trouble.